matrix uh, on Xen, which is uh, was the basics for all the major cloud uh, operators in the world, like Amazon or Rackspace. Uh, and after that, I work two years in OCaml Pro, which is a consulting company for OCaml, where I developed OPAM, which is a package manager for OCaml. So if you have any question related to uh, OCaml or OPAM, uh, let, let me know. Um, I know that quite well. Uh, and then I started like one year ago to, uh, I joined the University of Cambridge where I started to work on, uh, on Mirage, which is an operating system fully written in OCaml that I will try to describe uh, to you now. Uh, so first, first of all, uh, we, I think, uh, creating distributed systems is still uh, an open problem. We don't really know how to do that properly. There's a lot of possibilities, and uh, none of uh, it is none of them are very uh, satisfactory, I guess. Uh, so just a quote from uh, a principal engineer on Twitter saying that, uh, well, we, we we know how to make modules to create components and compose them together in a synchronous way. But when you start putting them together in a distributed system, that doesn't work at all. Everything is broken, uh, concurrency issues everywhere. And uh, so, so uh, the question is why, why is this the case and how we can solve that? So well, I think the, one of the cause of that is because we started to create uh, systems on uh, thinking on only one, one processor, only one user. Uh, and uh, so if the environment is very simple at the beginning, which is only one thing. Uh, and then we try to apply the same ideas to a lot of different things, uh, the cloud, uh, programming the phones, using JavaScript to make asynchronous web clients with callbacks and such. Uh, then we want to put things inside the objects everywhere. We want to put uh, processing data in the processing power in the lamps or in the bulbs or everywhere in your fridge. Uh, and then we have uh, kernels where we are very critical uh, piece of software we work, which works inside the operating systems. And, and we try to apply the same kind of, of techniques for all of this stuff, and, uh, that, but, but we cannot do that because uh, every component is different, every, every architecture is very specific, so we develop every time a new set of tools to work on that. And so we do every time the same thing, and so we repeat every time some mistakes. We have the bugs everywhere, we script everywhere. So that's, that's not a good way to, to go. So, so what, what, what I want just to explain first is, yeah, I think one of the main problems is uh, the complexity. So we are trying to build big systems uh, without really thinking about how to do it, just trying to, to pile things together and hope it will work, and uh, that will not work usually. So everything is, is very mixed, term. there is no clear separation of concerns between the different components. Um, more, moreover, when you talk, discuss about uh, operating systems, the problem is uh, we want to offer to users a lot of different things, like uh, you want dyna dynamic libraries, you want to be able to load code dynamically, uh, you want to be able to support multiple users on your computer. On your phone, it's not really necessary, but you still have uh, the same, uh, same uh, design ideas which are, which are here at the beginning. And you want to run multiple applications. Uh, I think the first iPhone was not able to do that, and so people were starting to complain, so they added multi-threaded uh, multi application after that, but uh, uh, usually on top of that, you, you have to choose which software you will install, which version, you, you, will, try to, you have, will have to understand how they will interact uh, together, and then you will have to configure every application separately, putting some configuration files somewhere on your system, which will be different depending on the application or the version, and then depending on where uh, you want to deploy your application, you will need to configure your firewalls, your, uh, all the different parts of the system. So, you have so, yeah. so what we said is, okay, this is not acceptable, or we cannot do anything with that, so we want to start from scratch. Why not? Uh, and and, and um, we want to, to design uh, new stuff in a very nice languages, or functional programming languages, for instance. Uh, but the idea is, it's very weird to, to say that, okay, we, we have an application, we will write into uh, Haskell or Clojure or OCaml or whatever, and then we will just put it into, into an operating system like Linux or Windows, and it will run there. Uh, so the nice language that we build with a nice abstraction, they will be surrounded by a lot of uh, unsafe C code, like 50 million or so of lines, 
and with bugs everywhere, and so that it's not much better. So the only way uh, is to start from scratch, even below the application level, so at the OS level. So uh, what we do with Omirage is we, uh, so we rewrite everything, and, uh, and an ex example here is, uh, so here I've got a small QB board, which is uh, like the Raspberry Pi, where um, everything is compiled, where well, everything is written into OCaml in, inside that, and that actually the presentation is connected uh, from my browser, which is, if you can look at the top here, it's, uh, I'm connecting directly to inside the QB board, and so the QB board is serving my answer presentation here. Everything is done in OCaml from the application to the network uh, stack and, and the OS as well. So everything is, is there. Um, so we are using Z as a, as a, as a um, target uh, uh, compilation, as a compilation target. And, and the world application, so the, uh, the network stack, the website, uh, the data, so the images and uh, the everything is uh, it's around one megabyte in size, so you can just take it uh, and move it uh, everywhere, and it will work as well. It will work. Uh, so that's just a source file describing the application logic, uh, some configuration to say that you want to use DHCP, for instance, or which uh, which storage uh, backend you want to use. It it works uh, very well on on ARM, uh, and the idea is uh, the binary is small enough to be uh, kept into Git. And so you can uh, version control the binary as well. So usually, you are, if you are a developer and you have a good process in your company, you are using a version control to, source, to uh, version control your source code. And the idea here, you do the same thing and you version control the binaries as well. So when you deploy your application in the cloud or anywhere, you can say, oh, this version, com this application, this bi binary is uh, version number X, which came from the source number X, etc. And so you can have a full story of the binaries as well. And, and, and so what we want to do with Mirage is to focus on portability, so target the different platforms, uh, but for, uh, using modularity to say that actually you just write the application once, uh, the source code of your application, and then you switch underneath the different components and it will be transparent to the user. And the thing is it's safe and it's performant as well. And I will try to show you that in the, in the so yeah, so that's just uh, that's not the same uh, Raspberry Pi, but it's bigger. But, uh, never mind. Uh, so yeah, so just to, to summarize, so complexity is the enemy, and we try, we want to be simple and efficient. Uh, sim be simple and small, meaning that uh, if it is small, it can boot quickly. If it is small, there is less attack surfaces for attackers to try to uh, get access to the system. Uh, well, you will say, oh, it's not very new. Uh, we use already Docker. With Docker, we can create images and send it to other people, and they can use it. So, what's the difference with Docker? Just quickly. Uh, so, well, if you look on the left, uh, you have the usual uh, system stack with different layers on layers, which has been added, uh, which has been added years after years by different researchers and uh, and people in the industry. And and what you do in Docker, you take the full stack, you create just one container, and you put it on top of something uh, which is uh, the hypervisor, like Zen, uh, or KVM, or uh, something like that. Uh, but the idea is you still have the full stack, so it doesn't really help for making thing, things simpler. So the idea is you, you break everything into modular parts. Uh, then you, you only take for your application the parts that you need. For instance, if you do an application which doesn't use uh, the network, if it is not a, a, a network application, you don't care about the TCP IP stack, and you can just remove it. Uh, and so you can just dead eliminate, uh, do dead code elimination to remove all the unnecessary code, and have a very, very small uh, application in there. Uh, so yeah, so the idea is you take your configuration files, your source file, uh, you, the components that you want, and then you link them together, linking like, as a compiler link. So you just create a small binary which contains everything, uh, configuration, so configuration uh, source code and uh, the system libraries, and that, that is a self-contained uh, and small images. Um, and so yeah, that's uh, the, the idea here. You put everything and you compress that into a very small, uh, very small image. And then you can decide where you want to run it. So you can run it on inside Unix, 
So you can keep the normal TCP IP stack of Unix, which is uh, tested from here, so uh, you think it works well. Uh, or you can, um, you can say, okay, actually, well, so this is just uh, the language runtime run here. And, but you can as well integrate everything. Uh, so you can say, I want to write the TCP IP stack in your kernel as well and use it in my application. I want to have a FAT or NTFS, uh, NFS, sorry, uh, storage, and I want to link that to, together into my application. So you, you speak the component you want, you link it together, and you get one single uh, self-contained application that you can run on, on top of uh, uh, Unix or Xen, which is uh, what is powered, uh, what is powered Amazon or Rockspin. So having the full control of the stack, you can do whatever you want uh, on the runtime as well. You, may, you control the runtime, so you can, you can simplify everything. You can say, well, actually, there is no, the, the memory uh, of my application is very simple. There is specific zone, which are uh, the stack of my application, something which is only uh, uh, reserved for the network. So now you know that only incoming packets will go here, and so everything will, uh, which comes from the outside is from that, that, that zone in memory, so that cannot really contaminate the rest of the application. Uh, and uh, allocating and just moving a pointer in the stack, so everything is very efficient. Uh, and uh, some example of the size of the bina binary, so we wrote a DNS server in a kernel, fully from, from the application uh, logic to the, the network stack. And at the end, it's like a compressed version is one, well, 100 of kilobytes. So you have, in 100 of kilobytes, you have the full uh, application and network stack and OS uh, things which, needed, which are needed for the DNS. Um, uh, then we just some example of of, uh, latency of uh, performance measure to show you that it's efficient. So here the, the example is uh, we we want to uh, to start uh, application or, or, or virtual machines on demand. So here we want to do an, a DNS request to get uh, an HTTP uh, page, and we start a Docker uh, image to uh, just to serve the, uh, the HTTP page. And usually, it's around uh, one, sec one, one second and, and one dot four seconds. Uh, we try to hack it uh, a little bit to make it faster, but uh, everything's crash. So uh, sometimes it's, it's faster, but usually it's just crashing, crashing. And then we do the same thing for Mirage. And for Mirage, as we control the world stack, it's very easy to uh, to add optimization. So here we have just a small optimization where we have um, um, an, app an application with, which is always on and which listens to an incoming TCP connection. And when it gets a scene, it just uh, opens the connection and passes the connection to the other application, which is at the same time wake up. And so the wake up is very fast. It's, it can happen in 300 milliseconds. So that means that when you send a DNS packet, you can just wake up a, a virtual machine and reply directly with, with the first uh, TCP connection, like in, in 300 milliseconds. So it's very, very efficient to boot. Uh, yeah, the summary, so if you start to boot a VM just to serve an HTTP page, uh, if you take Linux, you need to, to boot the whole uh, virtual machine, so it takes uh, more than five seconds, or usually 10 seconds. If you, if you try to boot a Docker container, it's uh, more than one second. And if you try to boot a Mirage unit kernel, which is called Jitsu here, is a very specialized instance of it, it's uh, less than one second. So you can use it uh, to uh, just to serve traffic in real time and create application in real time. So it's very, very, well, with that kind of thing, you can think of a lot of different applications. We are just starting to discover what you can do. It's very, uh, very fun, actually. Maybe yeah. if you have ideas, I'm very keen to, uh, to listen to them. Right, so it was a very fast introduction. So now I will try to div dive a little bit into details. Uh, so first, I will present OCaml because I'm not sure. I would, yeah. First, do you know OCaml? So who already tried to use OCaml in their life? Wow. <laughs> good, good. It's, it's uh, much more than I was expecting, but uh, good. Uh, then I will just show a little bit the workflow to develop application. Airmin, which is a uh, uh, the new a storage system of Mirage that I can describe a little bit in detail, and uh, OCaml TLS, which is a implementation from scratch of the, of the TLS uh, stack, uh, which is something what we can do for fun because it's fun, but uh, I will try to explain. So OCaml. So on the, if you go to OCaml.org, I will tell you that OCaml is an industrial strength programming language which supports a functional, imperative, and object-oriented or or style. So it's, uh, well, 
I mean, that's very general. Uh, so what it is actually is, uh, well, it's uh, very pragmatic. So if you like programming with objects, you can use objects in OCaml. Uh, usually people don't, but uh, very few libraries which are written like that, and when it's useful, uh, you can use it. Uh, if you want to use mutability because you like uh, mutable state, you can use it as well, it's fine. Uh, people kind of use it actually, uh, but it's very localized in, inside the function. When you want to do a for loop, you can just do a for loop. Uh, but then you try to avoid having global state because it's uh, very bad to, uh, for concurrency issues. And then if you want to have functional uh, programming with functions and purity, you can do it. And the main difference, I guess, with uh, Haskell is uh, everything is strict. As in Haskell, everything is pure, uh, which I think that's the main difference be between the two languages. Uh, it's stat statically typed. So I think there's two good things for stati statically typed languages that I'm not sure people are really aware usually. So when you are stati statically typed, that means that you can have good performance. Why? Because that's a compiler uh, knows in advance which are the types of the different things. So you can optimize the code to generate it. So if you have a plus uh, and you have two things uh, on the left and on the, on the right, uh, if, you are, if you are using JavaScript, uh, you don't know that if the plus is a concatenation or the addition or, or if it is, well, you don't really know. So in OCaml, for instance, plus is always between an integer. So it will be optimized as a only one uh, assembly, assembly instruction, so it will be very, very efficient. Um, and then types are very good as well to uh, structure your code uh, to ensure global invariance. So you can say, uh, I know this this data, well, this kind of data follow that patterns, and so I will describe it in a, with a special type language, saying that, uh, I don't know, it is a case analysis between different cases, or it is a record, and then you can apply that, uh, and the compiler will tell you, oh, here you, you use it as a, in a wrong way, and you try to correct you. So it's really a tool to help you improve your program, and it's uh, like a game where you try to press enter, and you will complain, saying, oh, this is not good, so you fix it a little bit, you correct it, and yeah, it's very interactive, and you have to, to, well, to treat the compiler as a tool, not as an enemy. A lot of people saying, oh, types uh, will just complain and doesn't want me to write my program. But actually, it tries to help you, so you have to be kind with him as well. Uh, a bit of, little bit of history, so I think, yeah, it, it's a direct descendant of uh, ML from Milner uh, in the 70s. It's closed browser uh, F Sharp, which is, a, well, which started as a, as a fork of OCaml. Uh, for the uh, .NET environment, and then now it's a bit different language, but, uh, but the roots are very similar. And uh, interesting, uh, interestingly, Don Syme, which is the main uh, F-sharp developer, is in Cambridge as well, and this was last week we saw a talk of him, and he was saying, well, yeah, uh, the main lang was a pr language I prefer is OCaml, but I was forced to, to use .NET, so I had to write F-sharp. But so he really likes OCaml, apparently, so it's a uh, usual like it as well. Uh, and then Haskell is a closed browser as well, uh, but uh, it's uh, lazy, and the type language is a bit more expressive, so you have to put more type annotation to be sure that it's compiled. Uh, it's created by some French people, uh, so Xavier Leroy from Inria, almost 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, it's teaching a lot of different uh, type university in Europe and US. In the African India, I'm not sure people learn it or teach it in, in university. I'm not. One, where? Okay, so if you can drop me a line to tell me which one is it, I will be very interested to know, because uh, I think we need to spread it a little bit more to be useful. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there is very strong roots in academia, uh, but there is as well a uh, lot of industrial, well, lots. There is, uh, there is uh, important industrial users, major industrial, industrial users. Uh, the main one is uh, Gen Street, which is a hedge fund company in, um, um, in Wall Street. I think they, uh, they do five, between 2 to 5 percent of all the transactions in Wall Street. And all the code is written in OCaml, everything from uh, the administrative tools to the traders tools, so everything is in, in OCaml. Uh, there are few people doing that for, for system-related reasons, so C Citrix and Red Hat. Citrix are doing, is doing it for Grand Server. So the, ma the management tax, um, tools of Xen is, is completely written in OCaml. Uh, then you have Facebook, which uh, 
I don't know if you heard about, but they released uh, the Hack language a uh, few months ago. And Hack is written in OCaml. And uh, so we know very well the people uh, do it, who did it at, at Facebook. And we hope to have a more complete, well, more integrated relationship there, because they got very nice tools from IDE tools that we want to use for OCaml as well. Uh, and then you got a lot of security, or like CI is, is uh, the main uh, nuclear power builder in France, and so they want to, to sh be sure that the software doesn't have any bugs. Uh, Dassault and Thales are doing planes. planes. Ancy is a French, uh, French security agency, which does a lot of tools in OCaml as well. So yeah, so if you look at that, what you, well, the, the, it's different, different kind of, of companies, but the main point is you are worried about bugs in your programs. If you are very, so like when you are tra trading on, uh, on Wall Street, if you, are, if you have asked to trade like for $100, uh, dollar, and then you get uh, a minus which come just at the beginning of your, of your number, and then you iterate that in a loop for one billion times a second, you can be a big trouble in your company, you can just, uh, yeah. So you really want to be sure that what you do is, is correct. And, uh, and I think it's working quite well for this kind of users. Uh, and then a few years ago, so two years ago, there is uh, OCaml Labs, which are being created in Cambridge, where I'm now working, and I'm not, I'm no, uh, I'm working here now. Uh, and I think there was around 10 to 30 people working on stuff related to OCaml there. And uh, so we try to improve the different toolings around the language and to make it uh, more usable in, uh, in uh, academia. So if you, want, if you are in a university and you want to teach it, uh, feel free to, to uh, keep in touch and it can help you to, uh, to give you uh, materials there and, and so on. Uh, so then uh, another thing is uh, we are creating a li library OS. So we want a lot of components which are uh, written in OCaml. And we want to be able to pick the right component uh, when we will need it. So we need it, uh, for that, we want uh, a good package manager as well. Because uh, if you have a lot of different uh, parts that you are assembled together, if you have to do that manually, it's very painful. Uh, so a few years ago, I started to write, so two years ago, I started to write OPAM, which is the package manager for OCaml, which is a mix of Cabal, which is the one for Haskell, uh, and Homebrew, uh, where Everything is based on Git. So you have a Git workflow. Uh, you can pull requests to add a package. You can have multiple repository, which is uh, dis distributed. And, uh, and we use the same uh, constraint solver as, uh, as Debian, which is UDF, uh, because we, we have a strong ties with the people there. So I think it's a very nice one. And it's not very specific to OCaml. So if you are using a language and you are looking for a good package manager, maybe you can try OPAM and, and tell us your experience. So we have more and more contributors, more and more packages. Uh, and at the end, uh, the experience with OCaml is, uh, uh, the goal is we started with a quite large bit of C code, and we tried to remove remove a lot of, of, of it. And, uh, and it's getting smaller and smaller, and we are very, very happy with that. Um, I think the main thing is uh, we started like four years ago, five years ago, this project, and we had to write three times uh, the whole OS, and maybe we write it four times soon, I don't know. But the thing is, it's not very hard. It's just a bit uh, painful because you have to understand everything, and you have to, it's very interesting, you have to, to look, look into the details. But then it's not very hard. It's, uh, you are using a high-level language, you put things together, you put the, the, the application logic is very clear. You don't need to worry too much about the low-level things. So you can really take uh, any kind of protocols that you want to know, and just trying to implement it, it's a very good way to, uh, to understand it. Uh, and then when you try to implement it again, you will uh, try to ask questions about why people did that like that. It's, uh, it's not the best way to do it. And, and then you say, oh, maybe I can try to do another way. And usually it's a very good, good uh, part to, to do research or even to create new products which are very uh, innovative. And uh, we have a very strong support for that with uh, Citrix, for instance. We started to use uh, Mirage a lot for all the tools internally. And so it's very useful to have a quality uh, control uh, coming from the industry as well. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the, and at the end, uh, yeah, I think that's all for OCaml. Do you have any question uh, regarding OCaml? Yeah. Um, so we have a student in Cambridge is working on that. 
Stefan Delan. Uh, he, he showed the first results last month, and he got a very nice, well, very nicely working prototype, which is still a prototype. And then we are discussing with the with the Inria people uh, to make to try to upstream the patches, and they are happy about that. So I think in few, yes, one to two years maybe uh, we will have multi-core kernel. Other question? No. Okay. Okay. So now just an example of. Uh, oh yeah. Sorry. So, so there's f very few things which are specific to OCaml, which are um, so there's few variables which are what what is the compiler version, or uh, and then the, the the full thing is in OCaml every you have to track the dependency very closely, and when you change something in the chain of dependency, you have to recompile everything on the on the chain. So it's very it's very very strong dependency there. Uh, so that is. That it fits very well with compiled languages. So in Python, it doesn't really make any sense to have that for Python. But if you have a compiled language, I think it's it's very it's fairly easy to. Uh, we made it work for C, for instance, and for. Uh, for other language. Yeah. So we don't use object-oriented code in Mirage. Uh, it's most of the time is a functional. It's functional. Yeah, functional code. It's very functional. But then uh, when you are when you have packets and you need to read bytes into the packets or to write bytes, you have mutable mutable uh, memory. So you use mutability here because it's an array of, of, by, of bytes. Um, yeah, so we don't have the POSIX API because uh, so we have, we had to make a choice of what we want to support. So we don't have threads in, in Mirage, for instance. So we have lightweight threading, which is a very which is a thread handled by the uh, by the runtime itself, but there is no support for for really concurrent threading. It's everything is uh, uh, it's cooperative, so every uh, thread has, has to yield, and another one has, has, has to take the thing. And when you are blocking, you can just uh, start another uh, thread as well. So it is one one limitation. Uh, but the thing is, you don't really need that because you can just spawn two, two virtual machines, doing two like two process processes, and you're using a message exchange of messages or, or memory uh, or shared memory to exchange stuff together. Uh, but then what we I can maybe I would explain it a bit later, but um, we have a, a type for the, what is an OS, more or less. So we knew when you need time, you need uh, uh, you need a notion of uh, randomness, maybe or entropy, and, and and the thing is you can pick it if you need it or not, and you can and depending on the backends, you are you will implement it differently. I'm not sure I'm very clear. I'm not very clear, but I will try to explain it later. Yeah. Uh, you, you yeah. Yeah. So, so in Mirage, there is no POSIX API. So. Right. So uh, yeah. Currently, yes, but then what you can do is you can have your very so when you write something in Mirage, you, you hope that it is a thing which is very important to you, so it should be very safe and very efficient. But then you can use legacy application in, inside separate VMs, and then we have a, we have libraries to uh, to communicate efficiently between the, the Mirage and the legacy application. So we have we have shared uh, shared pages, for instance, we can we can set it between the two two VMs, and they can you, you have a very efficient uh, channel there. So the idea is uh, you don't really care about the POSIX or IBI compatibility, but you, d you care about uh, the high-level API. So if, if it is REST or if it is uh, or the protocol API, not the POSIX one. Uh, but yeah, for now, if you want to really use all of the Mirage stuff, you need to use a camel because it's, uh, it's everything is based on that. Uh, 
No, because for instance, if you have a small PB board like that, and you want to, to save power, you will just turn off all the applications, and it will just uh, consume no, no electricity at all, or very few electricity. And then when something comes on, you just start the VM, and it will just serve the traffic. Yeah, small devices. Yeah, not for cloud. It's just a, uh, uh, but even if you are in a, in a data center, you want to optimize as well uh, the number of VM which are running. So you want to kill the one which are not really running and uh, start it again. Okay. Well, it's it just well, it, the thing is usually you you, you kept it, you kept it. Um, well, it was just an example to show that you can do that kind of stuff because we control the whole stack, so you can just uh, you can just hand over the connection to the over VM system. Anyway, I'll try to continue. Uh, we'll just try to explain how we write an application in Mirage now. Uh, so the first, we, st we start by just writing your code in OCaml. So you have to learn OCaml first. But uh, if you go, if you come on Saturday morning, I will try. I will try to show you. It's not so hard to learn. Uh, and then, for instance, you have your uh, you have your application, which is here, the code for your application, and you, you are using a code for an, an HTTP uh, server here. Which use the normal uh, TCP, the normal TCP/IP uh, stack on Unix. So here you just the OCaml code is ju just here and here, which is the application on top of HTTP and the HTTP server itself. Uh, and then you you just do Mirage configure and Mirage build, and that will give you an application that you can run inside Unix. So you run the application, and then you can use the usual debugging tools inside Unix to debug your application. Okay, so now you want to be a little bit more fancy. And so you start to say, okay, no, I don't really trust the, the TCP IP stack of Linux, of Unix, uh, because it's full of C code and I don't really know uh, all the portability issues that have been done recently. Uh, and so I want to, to have a full, uh, OCaml, uh, full stack in OCaml as well. So you, what you do is you just change the dependency uh, to that stack, which is TCP and then IP. Uh, and then you, you use a, a turn tap uh, inside OSX, for instance, or, or inside Unix, to just get the normal packets. And then the packet is handled directly to, uh, to the stack, and all the IP and TCP processing are done in OCaml. Uh, and the thing to do that, you just need to configure again. Uh, well, I forgot, but you have to set up saying that you have an environment variable saying that you want to use uh, the direct stack, and then you compile again, and that works. And everything works. Uh, you don't have to change any line of code to use the new uh, the new stack. So now you say, okay, I don't really trust Unix because uh, it's full. It's 15 million of half line of C code, and uh, who knows what uh, what security holes there are in there. So I want to write everything in OCaml, even the OS. So what you do is after the the IP level, you just uh, use a Xen. Uh, you have the Xen device driver, which are written in OCaml as well. Uh, everything until the, even the bootloader is in, in OCaml, everything is in OCaml. Uh, and then uh, you just have to trust uh, the Xen implementation, which is uh, still in C, but smaller than, than the whole uh, Unix uh, stack. And to do that, you just have, have to, uh, again, to change, well, I forgot again, but you, you configure with a different option, do dash dash Xen, and that will work automatically. You don't have to change any line of your application to, to do that. Uh, I, will I will fix uh, the example because they are, uh, they are wrong, but uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, so the idea is you write your application, your high level application once, and then you configure it, you conf configure it multiple times. And everything happens uh, via the OCaml module systems, and we had built a tool which is uh, called Mirage, which hides almost all of the complexity to the user. Right, that's just an, an example. Uh, so then last thing, uh, well, last thing, next thing. Um, sorry. So as I said uh, at the beginning, um, one good thing about having very small um, kernel images is that you can keep, or kernel images or binaries, is that you can keep the binaries inside, inside version control as well. So you can use Git to version control your binaries. Uh, and then you can use a normal Git tools, normal Git workflow, to uh, deploy your application as well. Uh, so here what we do, uh, for, so the, the main openmirage.org website is uh, 
is built automatically every time we commit some source code into Mirage, Mira, in, into Mirage slash Mirage Mirage W on GitHub. Uh, then we have a Travis CI integration uh, service which builds uh, the, the which builds the, the binary or the kernel, and then we push using Git the Git push of the binary to the Mirage www dash deployment, and then from that uh, we take the latest binary and we put it online. So the thing is, you can just and and inside the binary you have the the shagwan of of uh, corresponding to it. So if you want to, let's say you develop your application, you want to tag a specific version, you just use the git tag to tag the binary as a, as a one which is currently in development. You can git log to see the full story of all the of all happens in the, in the history of, the, develop, of uh, the deployment of your application. You can pull to or push to uh, update uh, different websites with the same uh, version of, of the thing. And you can revert easily to a previous version using the easy uh, uh, workflow. Uh, before I continue, just a quick question: Do you, what do you know, Git? Who do, who do know, well, does know Git here? Do you know Git? Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah, who knows? Sorry, who knows Git? Right. Okay. So I, I'm not. Uh, and who? Okay. Uh, so. So if we and so if you use Git or GitHub, which is uh, the main well, uh, which is the main central uh, repository of Git projects and on the web, uh, you can use it as a as a getaway for all your your binary deployment. And so uh, it's a good good. Uh, you can think of, of some workflows are where when you start a service, it will try to pull automatically from upstream. So if you want to push a patch. Uh, to all your services, you just have to push the patch upstream in, on GitHub, and then all the VM which are started using that version of the binary will just pull the, uh, the new binary and apply the patch automatically. So it's very, well, it's similar to what you do when you have a Debian and you do a pretty get update, but the thing is it's using already the same tools as, as you do for the source code. So it's less burden than to, uh, less tools, well, it's very integrated workflow which is very useful in practice. Everything, yeah. Uh, yeah, you need to rebuild everything. Yeah, but uh, the compiler is quite fast, so it's not. Well, depend if you compile on the QB board, it's, very, it's a bit slow. Uh, yeah, it took me like maybe a minute to build the whole website. So, uh, but uh, but usually it's very very fast if you're on x86. Um, well, you, you, so when you push the binary in the, in the repository, you have the, what is an interesting in the hist is the history itself. So it has a commit message saying that that bin binary is a one after this one. And then you can, in the, in the commit message, you can say that uh, this is generated from the source code uh, at that address of which we, this version. Uh, yes, there are. Uh, but then if you want to, to deploy the application, you can just do git pull, for instance. Git pull and you get the, application, you get the binary hit itself. Uh, as it is very small, it's very quick. And, uh, but then you don't, yeah, there is no diff, uh, so you don't really, uh, the, the diff is not very useful. Uh, other question? So yeah, so so just uh, so, uh, so as I said, you need to every time you have a new version of a library, you need to recompile the whole kernel, and then take the in kernel and put it and deploy it again. Uh, but the idea, but the, what is interesting is as you get all the library, you can you can use uh, world program optimization to optimize it, to remove that code or to uh, in, to do more um, uh, inlining or stuff like that. Right, then, uh, the, then if you version control your source, you version control your binaries, uh, we say that, well, maybe that's not enough. We want to version control the data as well. 
So uh, the idea is you have a big application with a big database, for instance, and uh, you do some stuff, and then you want to debug what happens. So currently, it's a bit complicated to do it. You need to have a dump of the database. You need to uh, manually try to reconstruct what happens there. Uh, but that would be very nice if you can just have Git as well. You can just do Git log, and you see, oh, this process uh, put something in the database, and this one remove it. And then you, if you want to revert it, you do git revert. So it's very the, the normal, the usual workflow for git is very well adapted for, da for data as well. Uh, and so we build the uh, Airmin, which is a storage layer for uh, Mirage, which is a key value store, which runs both in user space and kernel space, and uh, which is very similar to git. So you can clone a database locally, you can modify locally, uh, doing whatever you want, and then you can push back the results, uh, and uh, you can uh, create branches locally or remotely, and synchronize between branches. So if you are very, if you are familiar with Git, that should be very, uh, yeah, just think about it as a, as a uh, version controlling your data instead of, instead of your source code. And, uh, but you want to do that as a library, so you want to use that in your code, and say, okay, now I want to persist that, that piece of data, save it to the disk or save it somewhere, uh, synchronize with this one, or, and so on. I will not really enter into details of, of Airmin, but uh, if you know, uh, so yeah, basically there's three different parts in the system. You have the object DAG, which is uh, um, an appendently uh, data store where you have blocks and the uh, address of the blocks, the SHA-1 of the block. It's what is written here. Uh, so y if you have your data, you can just serialize, it, serialize the data inside that, that, data, that object DAG. And uh, it can, we have different backends for it. It can be in memory if you want to have uh, transient data, or it can be persistent, and persistent using Git directly. Uh, you, can want to, you might want to encrypt the data or keep it in plain text. Uh, and then you have another one, which is a history DAG, which is just something which is put on top of the data, which uh, you remind uh, where you come from, or you merge, uh, what is your branches, and so on, uh, which is as well uh, appendently, so you can easily distribute, distribute it, and you can keep a track of, history of, of the history of your system there. So when you want to, uh, to inspect what happened on your system, you just write git log, and you see, well, you, you get log or any other tool using that kind of, of uh, stuff, and you can see everything that happened on the system. You know uh, which uh, process thread uh, added which data at, at what time and why, usually. So it's quite useful to do that. Uh, and then uh, the user can define his own data, data structures and specify the merge function between them. Like uh, if you have a, a log file, and you want to merge them together, you just want to respect the timestamp on the log file and, and interleave all the lines together. So if you, the user has the ability to define the merge function, and everything will happen uh, almost automatically. And then you have just the, the last one, which is the mutable tags, which is the only mutable part of the system, which is, uh, the, which is uh, you name uh, the head of your system, more or less. You say that currently I am here, and uh, when I'm, when you update your, your database, you move the head to another, another state. So that's all, the only mutable part of the system which is not distributed. Uh, so that's quite easy to think about uh, concurrency in that, in that setting. So if you want to use it, you can use, use it well, via a standalone tool as well as a library. So uh, with different uh, formats, which are, so I think the main interesting one is, is a Git bidirectional link. So you can use Git to modify your data and then the application will see the result as well. Or you can modify your data inside the application and Git will see it as well. And I have just a small movie. I'm not sure that will work very well. Yeah. OK, it doesn't work. Okay, so it was it was just an example of um, a 
Okay, so, so uh, David Scott, which is a chief archi archi architect of Zen Server in Citrix, uh, started to use Yamin now to, uh, to power Zen Store, which is a main database, in, that database into, uh, in inside Zen. And so he used it, and uh, which was a video of, uh, of the output of uh, starting a VM and see uh, everything which happens inside it. But uh, okay, no connection, so it doesn't work. Right, uh, any question related to storage, Ermin? No? Okay, good. So last one is uh, TLS. Uh, so was currently, so everything in OCaml, in Mirage is written in OCaml. So everything is uh, type safe. You have memory safety, abstraction, everything is fine, modularity. Uh, and then when you try to publish something online, you have to rely on uh, bindings to OpenSSH usually, which is a kind of a unsecure, unsafe C code if you uh, try to listen to what happens recently on OpenSSH. And so one of the motto of the people which did that is uh, every line of C code is one line too much, one line too much. Uh, because you cannot really trust uh, that line of, of C to not completely uh, put garbage into your memory and corrupt everything. So, uh, so David and Hannes, which are two very nice guys, which they were in uh, in Mir Left in Morocco, and they decided to well, they, maybe they didn't really enjoy the, the bitch too much, so they decided to start hacking on on a new implementation of TLS in OCaml. Uh, to try to just learn about the protocol and, to, and, and they were saying, oh, it's maybe not so hard to, to make it work. So it's, it was like six months ago, or a bit, maybe a bit more. Um, so they started to write the protocol logic in pluri-functional style, which is a high-level uh, protocol, how it works, uh, what is the renegotiation, renegotiation between key and so on. Uh, and then try to isolate as much as possible the side effects inside the, inside the, uh, the front end. So when you read the packets or when, when you put the packets back. Uh, and so it, they try to follow a very concise, useful, and, and very well-designed API. So if you are not aware, so who knows TLS or SSH, SSL? No, okay. Nobody knows TLS? Uh, so TLS, that's uh, when you go to, to a new website and you, have, you put S at the end of HTTP. Uh, that use uh, uh, encrypted, well, uh, the, well the, um, the negotiation between the, the client and the server is encrypted, or is, well, there is a negotiation between the client and the, and the server to, um, to uh, set up a secure channel between the two, and once the, the, the negotiation is finished, everything which is sent on the, on the channel is encrypted, and, nothing, and no one can, uh, can get the content and intercept it. And, uh, and, and so on, and uh, so and this has, so if you heard about the um, health blade uh, bug, which happened very last well, two months ago or three months ago, which is a very major vulnerability in OpenSSH, which allow you, uh, allow anyone to uh, to use a HTTPS and a request to get uh, a state of the memory inside the in of the server, and if you use it, you can you can read a lot of things on in the server as credit card or, or whatever. So it's very bad. Uh, so, so you really want to be sure that that protocol is, is implemented correctly and there is no bug in it. And, uh, and you don't really care about efficiency here because you, what you really want is, uh, is something which is safe. So TLS, so, so that's something, at the beginning TLS is, well, it's written like, it's a very old protocol, so 15 years old, more or less. And everyone is using, using it on internet. And uh, the only implementation which, which is used is OpenSSH, uh, which is in C, and which is very, very, very unsafe. Um, there's a lot of attacks. If you Google for any of these attacks, you will see a lot of things. Uh, and so by writing, in, writing it in OCaml, we, want it, we can avoid uh, the go-to fail because there is no go-to in OCaml. Health bad because there is no, all, all the memory uh, management is done by the garbage collector, so there is no hand memory, well, the, the memory is not unmanaged, so there is no right kind of attacks. Uh, so this is more like a logic, a logic kind of attack, so, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I, will, I will just uh, explain it a little bit later. But uh, so, yeah, so there's different, different kind of, of possible attacks. And if you classify the different kind of attacks, most of the attacks come from uh, memory issues, more or less, buffer overflow or something like that, which are, uh, well, OCaml doesn't suffer from this kind of problem because the compiler will, will uh, ensure automa that automa automatically this kind of things are not possible. Uh, so, yeah. But so if you have, so if you don't have to uh, to manage the memory manually, it's easier. So there is no. So you can write TLS in a, a different. Well, you can write that in different languages, uh, and then you have to identify uh, the invariant of the program using types, and the types they show what is it, and and the compiler will help you to uh, to ensure that that it's safe. I, I I won't say that. Well. I will not say that there is no bugs in, in the TLS implementation, but will, there are bugs for not known yet, but I'm sure there are bugs. But uh, everything which is related to memory uh, and to language concepts like, go, like go to, I'm sure there are no bugs related to that. Uh, so the change cipher suite is a more a high level logical attack, which are, which are covered by, the, by just carefully designed the kind of types you are going to use, which uh, we hope to, uh, to be secure against that kind of attacks. And then the timing attacks are very hard to, uh, yeah, so in OCaml and every garbage collected language, you cannot be sure about that. And uh, in C and every, so yeah, so, so you never know about that. It's very hard to, to cover that. So just some statistics. So just number of flat enough codes doesn't mean a lot of things, but it's uh, just a uh, matrix, uh, good matrix. Well, maybe not a good, but it's a matrix. Uh, if you look at what uh, OpenSSL is using, is uh, yeah, it's 17 million of code, 17 million of line of code, mostly C, which is a bit scary if you already done some C code in your life. Uh, I mean, usually you have a between yeah, it's one every 10 lines of code you have a bug, so that's. That's, okay, but that's very old, old code base, so I'm sure most of them have been fixed, but I'm sure there's still plenty of them in there. In there. Uh, for OCaml TLS, we have uh, 125,000 line of code, which is quite big as well, because we still have 75k uh, of C code, which is mainly the OCaml runtime, uh, which is maybe, well, which has, so there has have been some effort to try to formalize it and to automatically, but yeah, we are, we are hopefully there's no many bugs there. Uh, and then the results is, so uh, yeah, but if I can go that, if I don't have any admin access, it will be difficult. So we have a live implementation of that, which is tls.openmirage.org. I really want like to show you that, so I will try to connect. Uh, okay, um, so if you connect to it, you will see that you will have, uh, I think I have, sorry, I'm not showing my light. Yeah, okay, so if you connect to that site, you will see that uh, you have uh, the full explanation of what happens between the client and the server in real time. And you have the, uh, so here the client sends some messages and the server replies some other messages and a lot of things happen and then you have some encrypted uh, data there. Uh, so everything is written in OCaml, you can test it and it has been, so now it is part of Citrix uh, more or less software, they are used by them, so they, they monitored uh, uh, the people which discovered the Heart, 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 bug, la, heart Blade bug to try to test it, to pen test it. Uh, and so they tested it for one week and they didn't find any kind of uh, security issue in, uh, in there. So that doesn't, that doesn't mean there is no security issues, but, uh, uh, but it seems to work quite well. And uh, all the development is, is done in a B it's open source, everything is open and people can, can complain or just uh, try to, to do some stuff. Oh, my slide. Uh, 
So it survived the it even survived some account news front page for two or three days, and people were clicking and tried to access it and didn't die. So I guess it's a good sign that it worked. Uh, and it's still in progress to to become uh, to re to have a proper release. Currently, we don't really expect people to use it in production because it's still like kind of prototype. But we're, we're in, uh, I think in one year it will be very well. In a few in the few months it will improve. Uh, so you can use it directly. Uh, what is uh, very nice, I think, is so so Dav Anes uh, Menert and David Caloper. So they are the two main de uh, the two developer of that, of that stuff. And they did it in six months. So um, I think that's a good proof that you can take any kind of protocol in the internet or any kind of application and, and do everything from scratch uh, using the right tools and the right people, maybe. But, uh, but the right tools is, a, is the most important thing. Right, conclusion. Uh, so we, re we released uh, Mirage in July, Mirage 2.0. With a lot of different improvements, uh, we are not we are not part of the Linux Foundation uh, indirectly through the Xen project, so we get resources from there. Uh, if you want to contribute, you are welcome. It's BSD code more, uh, mainly. So if you want to ask questions or to propose new stuff, we are very welcome to do it. Uh, if you want to use Unix kernels but with a different language, I'm sure a lot of people want to do that. Uh, you can try over. Other people try to do the same kind of things, like LVM, which is a Haskell implementation. We are trying to share most of the, co of the C code. Uh, we are trying to share it as much as possible between the two projects, because um, they are using, uh, as well, Mirage OS for specific tasks. And they are using uh, uh, LVM for other ones. But uh, they, they are a bit complementary, and we try to, so we are good friends. We are doing the same things, but we are good friends. And uh, we try to, uh, to compare the performance and the abstraction cost. And uh, if you like, uh, I'm not sure, I never used Bing or OSV. I don't really know the status. I think they are still quite prototype and not very stable yet. So you can try it, but I'm not totally sure you can, can use it in, the, in the production yet. And if you have any ideas of small application that you want to use, uh, feel free to keep in touch. Uh, I think, yeah, just last, last slide, and after that, you are free to go. Um, so why we do that? We want we want uh, what we want is is people to be able to write uh, their own application and deploy it very easily on their own infrastructure. We really want people to uh, to claim back uh, the digital life. What we say is that uh, we don't want the data to belong to Facebook or to Google. We really want everyone to be able to uh, to deploy an, a mail server on his home or whatever. Uh, and that should not be too difficult. Uh, currently, it's very very hard because you have to be uh, an expert in Linux administration to do it. But if you have the right tools, it should not be like that. So uh, uh, we see Mirage as a, as a basis for that. We want to have something which is easy to use for people and easy to deploy, and, uh, and they can rely on it easily. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks for your attention. If you have any questions. <laughs> Question? Sorry? Uh, as they, uh, so the direct Mirage route, yeah. which you had spoken about. So who are the people? I mean, where can I get a host for that? Uh, so you need a Xen provider. So you can go to Amazon, Rackspace, any, any cloud provider, basically providing Xen. It's like 80% of the public cloud, so it should be, it should be okay. If it is VMware, it doesn't work yet, but it's not very, we need to find people to, to write the, the basics stuff, but it will not be very difficult. Okay, VM as well, it should be simple. Um, so how many, how many unique kernels we can have on one host? So when you boot uh, one kernel, is like you need uh, okay. This this VM needs 256 memory uh, me megabytes of memory, uh, but you can squeeze it to 16 maybe or eight. It doesn't need, need very much. Uh, so you can have thousands of them. 
uh, it's very similar to uh, processes actually. So what we think is uh, unikernels are the same thing as process, but for the cloud. Yeah. Hi. Uh, would you be having a shell or a file system? What all things will you be missing in this? Uh, so you don't really miss shell okay. uh, because you can you can uh, you can link with a custom ripple, and so you can connect to it, and then you have a full ripple inside the VM, and you can do uh, your you can just use your normal language as a ripple, but inside the VM and do whatever you want. Uh, file system, you, we have different implementation of file system. We have FAT, NFS. So you, sh you choose the one you want and you link it directly, and that will work. Or you can just uh, squeeze everything in memory and have no file system at all. It's, uh, or AirMain as well, which is Git. Uh, so you, you really have to, to choose what you want. You pick the pieces you need, put it together, and that's self-contained, and that's nobody can touch it. And that's Secure. Yeah. Um, so we have, at the low level bits, we have a, um, so when you see, a, when you look at the protocol, for large bit of it is uh, how to serialize data. So read data from the packets from the network or write data to the network or to the disk. Uh, and this is very, well, you have uh, four loops or not for, for loops, but you have to, to mutate state there. So we have some, some uh, syntax. Uh, can show you what I can show you. Uh, what can I show you? OK, so this is uh, the TCP IP stack, for instance. Uh, if you want to see the wire. So we have we have some some extension to uh, to describe uh, maybe not this one. We are straight. Where is it? So we have some syntax to be similar to to describe the thing similar to C. So you can say that uh, this is a C structure, a C struct, which have which have this field and and so on. Uh, I just where's the wire struct? Uh. So here, for instance, you, de you design that. Okay, so you have a type. You have a structure which is Ethernet. We've got the, some fields to the side. So this is very just declarative way to say the thing. And then when you want to access or to read the field, you just uh, call some function here. So for every field, you have a set or a get. So this is very, very stateful. Uh, you, ha you have to read the, the data from the packet and write, write to, to that. And then once you build some high level, so when you extract the, the, packet, the data from the, the network, you build some high level types, so data structures, and then you can use purely functional uh, stuff on top of that. Uh, like, uh, I'm not sure this is very nice, but uh, it's, so here it's very, so that you have a monad. So you, so you can have very high, high level abstraction here. So concurrent, we use a, con a concurrency monad as in Haskell where uh, everything is inside, every IO is in uh, a monad there. Here every thread has a separate monad and we, we compose thread together. So you have a bind and return. Uh, but that's a, that's a higher, higher, level, higher level. And then all the logic is very, is more or less pure. So you just have to call function there. Um, yeah, so we tackled, so the initial focus was to, on the network stack, so it was a network, and we have storage, storage backend, so we have few implementation of uh, some storage stuff, but then we, yeah, we don't really, foc well, we don't have any uh, use cases for data intensive stuff yet. If you have ideas, we are happy to discuss about that. Um, well, if you have no other question, I can, or well, feel free to ask me uh, the question later, and we'll see here. I will, and I, I will have a tutorial, if you want to learn a camel, 
I'm doing a tutorial on Saturday morning uh, on OCaml. So I think there are still seats there. You need to check. But uh, so Saturday morning, morning OCaml, I'm there. Right. Thank you.